had all manner of amazing stories this morning, a description of challenges and barriers, and lots of inspiring ideas. So what we're going to do now is take this to kind of another topic, which is the, uh, the promise of technology. How can different technologies potentially help us uh, get to the, the problem of uh, providing literacy education for um, people throughout the world? Um, so we in the U.S. published the National Education Technology Plan in November, and it laid out this broad vision for learning that is powered up by technologies that can allow all students to access a personalized, uh, more individual uh, opportunity to learn. The kind of personalized instruction that is in fact very participatory, that people can connect with each other, building in social technologies, building in mobile learning opportunities, building in um, amazing kinds of digital content that's being designed and developed, and building in the opportunity to continually learn from the interactions uh, as well. So I am actually not going to talk more about that, and I'm going to turn this over to our panel, because we have a, a fantastic panel, and um, they have a lot, to, a lot to tell you. What we've asked them to do is do some kind of short, snappy presentations, and we will go just a little bit over at the end of this. Um, I'm glad most of you stood up at least and stretched and, and took a bit of a break. Um, we'll go a little bit over, but we will have time for some audience questions, hopefully. So uh, be thinking about kind of what's inspiring you, what's interesting to you, what kind of innovations are you, are you listening, uh, are you hearing, and uh, what do you think the, the, is the promise of innovation and uh, innovative technologies for improving learning throughout the world. So with that, you have the bios in your package, so I'm not going to read those to you. I am just going to simply introduce the panelists uh, as they speak. So first up is Anthony Bloom. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Karen. Um, so don't start the timer yet, Stephen. I have a quick uh, question for the audience. Uh, how many of you could guess what the cost of the first mobile phone was when it was introduced in 1984? Just yell out numbers. Five thousand. Oh, darn it. Okay. <laughs> Am I giving this presentation? <laughs> so, okay. so 1984, the first mobile phone that came out cost uh, $4,000. Uh, that just gives you some idea of cost of innovation and lowering the cost of technology. I recognize though, Karen, that I may be one of the only ones talking specifically about technology. I believe there's a variety of other uh, innovations that are going to be discussed here. But Alexis and Karen asked me to be provocative, so I'll start off after your break with um, a provocative set of uh, slides. Okay. We've heard a lot about quality this morning, um, and don't need to underscore it further. It's hard to imagine how we will achieve our Millennium Development Goals. Uh, the challenges of schools and children um, having low resource settings, not having enough schools, um, without thinking about the contributing role of technology. Now, this isn't to supplant the importance of teacher professional development and the importance of traditional education systems, but as Nina Lilly had said this morning, how do we reach learners in all parts of the globe? And again, it's hard to imagine how we could do that without creative uh, uses of technology. This is a picture I took when I was in Mozambique with a number of kids that were trying to get in, and I thought this was an apt metaphor of kids outside the school system, but also what happens when they get into the school? What kind of challenges are they going to have in regards to access to uh, technology? So we're fortunately at what I would suggest is a tipping point in terms of regards of uses of technology. Um, we have a number of pilots that USAID and other development partners are supporting looking at low-cost technologies and interventions, whether it's uh, interactive media such as radio, uh, handheld devices. Uh, we see the cost of these are being lowered, and at the end I'll present a challenge in terms of our collaborative opportunities to lower these costs further. Of course, we want to make sure that it's cost-effective, accessible and scalable and sustainable. So again, it's not just to plant the importance of rigorous evaluation about the contrib contributing roles of technologies, but we're excited by what we see currently and over the horizon in regards to creative uses of technology to promote early grade reading. In our strategy, the new USAID education strategy, there's specific reference to the importance of partnerships. There was a question from a, the previous panel, somebody asked about engagement with private sector. I think this is an important area of collaboration as a development community that we recognize the innovation, the opportunities to collaborate with private sector organizations. 
Um, it's also important, again, that we underscore the appropriate uses of technology through rigorous evaluation. We don't want our technology interventions in countries to be led by technology of convenience, either that being promoted by a private sector in the developed world looking for an additional market, or the uh, allure of technology as opposed to seeing how it can be an important integral part of an education program. So that's why we want to make sure that there's rigorous evaluation. Um, USAID um, has been supporting a variety of challenges uh, to raise the level of awareness and to catalyze new ideas in regards to the use of science and technology in development. Uh, our administrator came on board and launched a series of grand challenges, including the first, which is the grand challenge on saving lives at birth. Uh, education will, in a few months will be announcing its grand challenge, All Children Reading, to look at specific opportunities and interventions to use science and technology to promote early grade reading. We're delighted that World Vision uh, came on board as our initial founding partner, and recently I've heard that OSAID has also come on board. So we're excited looking for other founding partners. We also suspect that we'll have a variety of applications that are related to mobile applications. And what I mean by mobile applications is not exclusively just a mobile phone. I don't know if how many of you have seen the Pico projectors. Has anybody used these Pico micro projectors? You can now purchase them for $100. What is the opportunity to connect a Pico projector to a flash drive to bring a mountain of resources into a low resource setting? Um, flash drives are another example. Um, USAD recently co-hosted a symposium with a variety of international institutions interested in mobile applications for education and development. And we're thrilled that, that we'll have a formal alliance uh, in short, uh, short order to build upon those experiences and best practices. Oh, and my, my last slide, so excellent. <laughs> this was a picture from, uh, from the Philippines when I was there. Um, our previous office director, David Barth, had always said to me, Tony, yeah, whenever you talk about technology, how is it going to help that young girl learner and wherever you're working? And I don't know if David's here as well, but I think about that in regards to the appropriate uses of technology as well. I'll tell you the opportunity, and I mentioned this at the beginning in regards to challenges, is if we work together as a development community to identify appropriate technologies that are sustainable and appropriate, how can we help lower the cost of that technology penetration into the communities that we're trying to serve? We represent a wide array of development institutions. Let's challenge the world to help lower the cost of access to bring those technologies to contribute to early grade reading. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anthony. That's interesting. Uh, we've been talking a lot about um, how we launch these types of challenges to the, to the world's investors and entrepreneurs. So we would love to talk with you more about that. That's a, that's a worthy challenge of uh, the best minds, the best innovators to, to, uh, to attack that. Um, and yes, this is a panel more about the, the vast variety of innovations, not specifically technology. So yes, I apologize for that. So um, the next speaker is Francois Jarina Schwa, and he will be um, uh, he'll be clicking through his best presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Francois Jarina Schwa, the Foundation Paul Jarina Schwa Foundation was named after my father when he left, uh, when he stepped down from uh, CEDA, Canadian International Development Agencies. My slides are in English, but my tongue is in French, but as I'm Canadian, we have uh, both uh, official languages, so I'll try to do my best in English. Thank you. The uh, foundation today, the core of our business is more towards employment, employment amongst the youth, and we are more into vocational training and assistance program. But uh, we did quite a lot in literacy, and we did quite a lot also in basic education. So if I go through this, we, we also have, and, and I'm not talking about it today because five minutes, wouldn't give me a, a good chance to talk about it, but we have this tremendous and humongous contest which is called Let's TPGL, which is a dictation contest that we've been running for 20 years. And it's a dictation, as I said, it's a dictation, it's called Let's TPGL, and we're among six African, sub African countries in French, and we gathered in the last 20 years 4.5 million participants from uh, Wu, we had 1.5 coming from Africa. And every year, there's African winning the contest. So it's just to tell you that they are avid of reading because we do distribute materials so they can win the contest. So that was, that, that's, as a good entry, uh, and we're very proud of that project. If I go, <clears throat> first project. Okay, I have three little projects here that I want to present to you. This first one is directly from, in my backyard in Montreal. 
Manawan is a little uh, community of 5,000 inhabitants and they're abor Aboriginal nation. Uh, they totally, totally illiterate. Uh, we went there last year with uh, my volunteers, Educators Without Border, with strictly one little ID, a multidisciplinary project that would put ahead a team. And we decided that team with them, which was the seasons. Uh, at Skamek natives, uh, they have six seasons, contrary to uh, most uh, North American uh, countries. And those six seasons are based mainly around their hunting and fishing season. So we decided to use that much the very uh, uh, subject, and from there we went on to do an exec to execute a reading program that was for four weeks. And what was very, very important is to involve, like some ministers said this morning, to involve parents and to make sure also the grandparents would be in, 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 the, in, the, part, in the portrait. And that finally that uh, we would finish, finish, finish it all with a one-month program uh, on the radio. And today, one year later, we're not there anymore, but the program is still going on and going very strong. The second project, which is from Quebec, uh, for, from Senegal, Saint Louis, and I'm the one who really, really put it, put it on and did this project. It's called the Quest for Knowledge. So, as you can see, I'm going to go read to my. It's going to be easy for me. I'll just make the description of the project because it's very interesting. We, uh, as a, we, we took a group of students, five to eight, armed with dictaphone, and we have interviewed and questioned the storytellers on three subjects. And then the kids choose their favorite project, translated from dialect to French, and then edited the story into books, tale of contents, chapters, introduction, conclusion, and acknowledgement, and finally illustrated their chef d'oeuvre. And the final act was a grand celebration at the village where they would act, sing, or recite their own work, their own story. So if you look at it, this is what it would look at the end. You have it in dialect on the, on the left, you have it uh, put on computers on the right, and you've got the illustration here. So we did great with that. It was done for the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie. And finally, I'm sure everybody around the, here know a little bit about interactive pedagogy, which we did also in Burkina Faso. And there the success was that at the end of the project, which was a project of a year, the ministry decided to have a uh, seminar and constructed a uh, policy around it. And today uh, they have inter inter interactive pedagogy amongst Burkina Faso. But the, the difficulties are the same that uh, Mr. Uh, uh, the administrator of USAID was, was, was saying this morning. The problem is always the same. We don't have ways of measuring how it goes today and how it's done today. So this concludes a little bit my presentation with me at the end of the five minutes. But just read maybe this uh, President Barack Obama's citation, which finished by, we also look at how we can foster the innovations that can be the game changers in development. Thank you. Thank you. And one of the key things that I heard uh, Francois say is talking about compelling projects that engage communities, engage participants, engage communities, a lot of storytelling, really interesting uh, uh, focus on the, on the human dynamics, and that's one of the things that we absolutely have to do. Um, we could spend hours talking about the, the measurement, but we won't. So, with that, we'll pass it on to uh, Corey Hyman. Thank you very much, Karen. Good morning, everyone. My discussion about innovation this morning is also not about electronic technologies. Instead, it is our attempt to grapple with the issue of global illiteracy using very traditional resources, teachers and books, but using them in strategic ways. At Room to Read, one of our main organizational goals is to help children to become lifelong independent readers. We started 11 years ago by building libraries, more than 1,400 libraries and school blocks built to date, and 11,000 libraries established overall, and stocking them with donated books, more than 6 million donated books to date. We quickly realized that donated books were not helpful for children at the earliest stages of reading if the children could not read the books in their own languages and began to publish exciting storybooks and nonfiction in local languages. Approximately 4 million books distributed from our local language publishing program, 550 titles, including books in 25 languages. We have also learned that to become lifelong readers, 
Children need to develop both the habit of reading and reading skills, and have therefore initiated large-scale research and development efforts in nine countries, now ten, in Africa and Asia, to bridge gaps in teachers' ability to teach reading, supplementary materials to support language textbooks, and children's reading habits. Our research and experience to date indicates that it is important to think about the kinds of resources that are needed at each stage of a child's literacy development to foster the goal of lifelong reading. This is particularly important for children from economically disadvantaged backgrounds who may have little exposure to books or reading before they come to school. Our first focus on teacher instructional support is being designed to help teachers think about how to and when to promote a range of literacy skills including listening, speaking, reading, and writing in different phases of literacy development, from pre-reading, where children develop speaking skills and listening comprehension, to decoding, to fluency, and reading comprehension. At the same time, our focus on materials development also takes into account the evolution of children's literacy skills. At the very earliest stages of learning, there needs to be a substantially greater emphasis on materials for instructional support. This is particularly important to fill the gaps in introductory reading textbooks, which often progress too quickly from a focus on letter-sound combinations to complex texts. As children begin to develop their reading skills toward automaticity, the point at which they are able to read word combinations with enough fluency to remember text, there can be a much greater emphasis on free reading activities to develop a longer-term habit of reading. The question is how to bring instructional support and materials together in an integrated approach. That is the innovation that is and will be Room to Read's research and development focus over the next few years. The anchor, of course, is sensitivity to the stages of children's literacy development. In terms of teacher engagement with reading resources, there is also an evolution of responsibilities, with the gradual release of responsibilities from teachers taking full responsibility of children's literacy skills development to children's independent reading. In terms of instructional support, Room to Read focuses on the development of supplemental instructional materials that fill in the gaps in the existing curriculum and provide children with extensive practice materials, practice, 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 at the earlier stages of learning. At the same time, we provide a variety of storybooks and nonfiction in classroom libraries and school libraries to expose children to the wonder of reading and the excitement of colorful books that they can feel and touch. At the early stages of literacy development, these include illustrated books with beautiful pictures that teachers can read to children as well as books without words for children to make up their own stories. We then provide picture books that help children practice their reading skills with texts that they can negotiate with teacher support, as well as books and formats that teachers can share and which children can follow along. Once children gain a level of fluency that they can comprehend more complex texts, we provide advanced books and perhaps in the future chapter books for practice and enjoyment. To conclude, I have a few um, pictures. Um, this first one is a page from a storybook in which children um, are able to develop their own stories. Here is a picture of a, a photo of a teacher working with children on exercises to supplement the government language textbook. A variety of materials designed to promote reading skills and the habit of reading. A teacher helping children to write using their fingers and the ground. A teacher reviewing and commenting on a child's written work. Children's stories colorfully written and illustrated on a classroom wall. Using letter cards to make words and play games. Paired reading with the buddies to support skills development. Creed writing exercises with practice, drawing circles, lines, and arcs. And last, children with workbooks to supplement the government curriculum. Thank you, Corey. That was interesting. Okay, uh, you know, it just remind us, remind us of the power of story and the power of language and the interactions between people as, as we build uh, child uh, literacy skills. It also reminded me that as we, as we create technologies to supplement these kinds of practices, really focusing in on the best of what Corey just said, and other researchers have said about how people actually do develop language and learn to read and the importance of social connection. Um, there's, there's a lot to learn, and if we can get the entrepreneurs and investors to totally understand those things, then we have hopes of building a, a supplements that can uh, potentially uh, 
scale up some of the, the best practices that we have across the world. So thank you. Um, I'd like to turn this now to uh, Shakil Malik and uh, for the next presentation. Thank you, Karen. This is a very happy day for me. Of course, I'm sure for many of you, because this came a long way. The reason that we are all celebrating the International Literacy Day at USAID, which is very uh, new, and this is the first time in the history of International Literacy Day, uh, because we have advocated for this for a long time, that we do it together. Of course, many of you are used to the tradition of International Day, uh, Literacy Day being celebrated by International Reading Association uh, and in our different venues and partners' venues. Uh, but we are also doing that this year too. There is a parallel event going on right now in Georgetown University, but that is completely focused on domestic issues in the US. And of course, I have not cloned myself yet, so I cannot be in two places. Uh, the second celebration is of course uh, uh, very important that uh, in this particular day, uh, UNESCO awards the International Literacy Prize. I, uh, and I want to congratulate, and this is a coincidence that Corey is sitting next to me. The award winner this year, one of the main award winners, is Room to Read. <laughs> and uh, this is, uh, there are uh, four, four other awards, uh, goes to Mexico, Burundi, Democratic Republic of Congo. So this is, uh, this is the second celebration uh, issue for us. Uh, the third uh, thing that I want to start with is that, of course, my topic when we started to talk about uh, what I will be talking about is uh, teachers. And before I start my few uh, points about teachers, I want to take this moment to uh, you know, really pay my respect and uh, my gratitude to all my teachers and one of them is sitting right here, Dr. Steve Cliss from the University of Maryland College Park. And uh, it's, it's amazing, without them, none of us, we would be here where we are today. So again, thank you, our teachers. Uh, basically, uh, there are four or five things uh, I will just mention uh, in the innovation of uh, teacher professional development. What we have seen over 60 years at International Reading Association is that uh, there are a few things that you need to really take uh, uh, seriously and give attention to when you are developing early grade reading uh, teaching. And I'm taking you one step higher. We are not uh, directly going to the student learning outcome yet. Before you go there, you have one step, which are the teachers. And then let's go one step above that is the teacher educators who are training the teachers. So we talk about evidence-based, student learning outcomes. These are still very difficult words for me. I don't understand all of this uh, too much. But uh, I, I, I understand the teacher educator. If my teacher is not, the teacher educator is not doing a good job, uh, then the teacher cannot do a good job, and the student would not do a good job. It's a very simple cycle for me. So uh, how does an active teaching in early grades reading look like? There are a few important issues. One is creation of supportive instructional environment. This is very crucial. Uh, and and it, would, it would include a lot of things. Smooth, efficient uh, time management within the classroom. And we all know this, 80 and 100 children in the class, most of the countries where we work. And of course, our uh, His Excellencies, uh, all of you know how you deal with your big classrooms and the teachers. So uh, instructional environment is very important. Attention to skill and strategies for reading success. Just because I learned sociology throughout my master's degree, I'm not a sociology teacher. Mm -hmm. I cannot be. You need to learn how to teach teaching. You know, it's so learning about reading pedagogy is crucial. Just because I work in the education sector doesn't mean that I know reading. That's why there is something called reading specialist. That's why there's something called reading researcher. It's very important to give attention. When you have a problem uh, you know, in your heart, you go to a cardiologist. You just go to an internal medicine doctor. So it's important to give attention to those people. That they, they are big in numbers, they know what they do, uh, and, and, and they can help us. The third thing is, is scaffolded instruction. It's very important that observed modeling by the teacher, participate in guided practice, there is demonstration and demonstration back, 
try out new strategies and skill on their own, and then you can give feedback. One time, one shot, training programs not gonna work. We have to give attention that these training programs are uh, attached to mentoring, coaching, ongoing mentoring in the programs. Connection to the language arts and discipline, disciplinary content. I want to congratulate Liberia to really make reading as a content area, not literacy as a content area, not saying that we do reading in other subjects. Yes, we need to do all of that, but making literacy as a content curriculum. This is a very important step. Uh, ongoing and informal assessment. Great assessments going on, of course, EGRA is, is very important, all the national assessment, but ongoing assessment by the teacher himself or herself in the classroom on a daily basis. Uh, and and, and that's, that's very important to think about. And of course, cannot uh, emphasize enough about the family involvement into all of this, that how the teacher and the family would interact uh, to help the children when they come home. Finally, there is no substitute for teachers who are knowledgeable, flexible, strategic in helping children learn to read. And of course, I will end with a very simple notation, uh, metaphor that I always use. We always talk about uh, think outside the box. I don't think we know enough about inside the box here. <laughs> so let's try to learn our inside the box and do well. So what are the four corners of our house? Then try to go outside. And thank you very much. If you want to know more about us, go to reading.org. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, the power, the power of teachers and, and again, what we can know from basic research. I had the opportunity yesterday to uh, meet uh, Charles Perfetti, who is at Carnegie Mellon and has been doing amazing research for many, many years. And we know a lot about how to teach people to read, but how that actually gets translated to people in the classroom, and love your analogy about specialists. Yes, good point. Um, and now I will turn it over to Jane Myers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my, the intervention that I'm going to talk about with the Labuta Library Project is, is fundamentally sort of different than the other ones talked about. It's an institution that can take advantage of all of these different kinds of interventions, but it's filling an important institutional gap in society. Um, Lubuto libraries are, are some an open system in, in a closed system because schools, as important as it is to improve them, and we work with schools all the time, schools are a closed system. You're either in or out. And unfortunately, there are many children who are out of school, particularly after the basic school level. And so that's why this institution is needed. Um, the objective is of our project uh, which is a scalable project and is, is going to scale right now in Zambia, uh, will, is to ensure access to high quality educational services, uh, to support holistic development and empowerment of children and youth, and to build capacity to train teachers and communities uh, to do this. Um, again, literacy actually is a means to an end, and I think a lot of the speakers earlier this morning talked about the role literacy plays. So we're going, we're aiming toward that end goal as well. Um, we've also found that effectively serving the most vulnerable youth, out of school children, orphans, vulnerable children and youth, requires professional library services drawing on a range of technologies and creating innovative programming that benefit the entire society and not just the vulnerable youth. I went a little ahead. Public libraries can, and Labuto libraries do, educate girls without depriving boys, provide access to shared technology and comprehensive book collections. And the shared is important. I hope someone asked a question about that. Um, educate out of school children, child head of households, and teen mothers. I, so we are able to reach out and bring these children in, and we have done it in huge numbers. Provide early childhood education. Again, that's something that happens all the time, every day in our libraries. Improve teaching and education quality. I'd love to have a chance to elaborate on that too. And to serve as a bridge to schools for out-of-school youth. Our libraries have been recognized within the library profession as a model for library services for disadvantaged children anywhere with a powerful and measurable impact. 
One thing that we know in our profession is that there are three necessary elements for successful libraries, the ones that will really have an impact and be sustained. You have to have an excellent and comprehensive collection, relevant programming, and effective outreach. And, and the collection needs to include all of the kinds of materials previously mentioned, including information technology. We have seen that our library programming is especially necessary for out-of-school uh, children. And, by, and I hope you all were able to pick up a handout that I had out where you pick up your um, badges that talks about our programs. There's one in particular where we have engaged Zambian teachers in partnership with the Ministry of Education and created 700 reading lessons, mother tongue reading lessons, that can be used in our libraries and can be used throughout the country. In other words, we have engaged children and teachers to create a hundred in each of the seven Zambian languages. So that, that's one thing that can be done in a situation like ours. Um, also to have, for such programs to be effective and sustained, you need to be working with the government and, and communities and both need to own it. Uh, you need to develop specialized architecture to have facilities that will accommodate the need. Capacity building is obvious, it's what Sakila talked about with t training teachers. And also what librarians do all over the world, which is preservation. Uh, it, it, it sort of seems to get forgotten that there, were, there have been in the past lots of materials, wonderful materials in Zambia, in local languages, and we have created a digital archive. We've tracked those materials down that don't exist in Zambia anymore, and we've created a digital archive. So I have one minute left. Oh, that's going to, anyway, just a tiny little story at the end, and I hope I can squeeze it in because it's about my mother, and I want you all to know about it. Um, my mom was born in Philadelphia, in South Philadelphia, in 1912, into a very poor Irish immigrant family. And when she got out of high school, as we were closing into the Great Depression in this country, she had absolutely no chance of going to college, and she desperately wanted to. Uh, but fortunately, she lived in Philadelphia and could spend all of her free time at the Philadelphia Free Library, the iconic first public library in the world, an innovation of a guy you may have heard of named Benjamin Franklin. And one day in the mid-30s, a woman physician at the end of her career came in and said to the librarian she wanted to send another woman through college and medical school. And did the librarian have any ideas? And Yes, indeed, my mother got a scholarship through college and medical school through, thanks to the Philadelphia Free Library. Met my dad in medical school and all five kids in our family grew up knowing that libraries were a magical place of opportunity. And, and that is what drives the Lubuto Project and I hope someday I have the opportunity to tell you about Loveness and Miriam and Betty and Joe and David and all of the people, all, all of the young people in Jambia whose lives have been transformed by our libraries. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. The, um, the, the power of libraries is, is uh, I think, even more important today than ever. A lot of people have been talking about the future of libraries. I was also reminded, as we were talking earlier, that the first Carnegie libraries had a room in them designed to teach people to read. So really thinking about kind of the power of libraries, sustaining that, and also making sure that that professional librarians, you know, continue to to evolve and help us deal with the vast quantities of information and data on the internet as well. Um, and with that, we'll turn it over to our final speaker, uh, Debbie Winston. Thank you very much. I'm Debbie Winston. My organization is called Literacy Bridge, and I am the partner relations manager based here in Washington D.C. So that we can work with you. Um, and. Okay, so this is a talking book. Anybody speak Twee? Yeah. Okay, so it doesn't look like a book, but it does speak in any language. Just a little bit about our work, an example of our education programs, and then um, a bit about the benefits for the entire community that we've been talking about. So we're a small NGO in Ghana in the United States. Uh, headquartered in Seattle, Washington. Our founder is a dedicated open source software engineer um, who designed this small, durable touchpad computer. Also very inexpensive, 
to make vital information and education accessible to billions of people in resource poor areas. We're passionate about ending global poverty. And so we work in remote rural areas so to find solutions to bridge the literacy gap. The talking book is simple, it's interactive, it is a computer, and it doesn't require electricity, internet, or cell service. So even a single talking book can serve dozens of learners with up to 140 hours of content in a variety of languages. Very easy for users to add the audio instructions in their own local dialect. It can also transfer learning materials to another talking book. It has a USB cord built in without the need for a laptop. And it captures relevant user statistics and user feedback. The, um, well, we were looking at the Upper West Ghana, a very remote area. And the Hain Primary School in Jarapa District has only four trained teachers. You may know schools like this. There are uh, six grade levels, the smallest class has 64 students, the largest one has twice that. So children work on subsistence farms, they rarely pass grade six, there's no electricity or running water, but sometimes there are textbooks. And the children can listen to recordings the teacher made and then practice by recording their own reading. This improves their English pronunciation. Two or four students can work together using headphones or in small groups with the built-in speaker so that even without a teacher or a classroom, they can learn. They can write words in the dirt with a stick or with their fingers um, or use whatever's available for learning materials. And they tailor their experience because the speed of the playback can be controlled by the user. Interactive multiple choice quizzes on the talking book test reading comprehension, and they're fun. New vocabulary words are introduced, uh, we call them audio hyperlinks. So a bell and a light signal that there's a definition for the word, which the user can access without losing her place, or skip over it if she already knows the definition of the word. So, um, you know, this is important when teachers are absent or unavailable and the students can still improve reading comprehension and pronunciation. Adults who can't read can sit with their children and a book to share the learning experience, another community impact. And there are talking books on the table outside, so please try them. You'll see that it's really designed to be durable. It uses um, standard D-cell batteries, which are available for approximately 35 cents US, the equivalent in most places in the developing world, and so that users can actually afford to buy them. Just a little bit about our other work, when subsistence farmers use the talking books for crop planting guidance, which was delivered in their own dialect, they grew 48% more food. This means they could send their children to school instead of keeping them on the farm. Traditional birth attendants have recognized the value in this, and community health workers use them for positive behavior change in hygiene and maternal child health. Again, for good outcomes. And adult non-formal learners use the talking books for functional and financial literacy. So, we think the talking book is a sustainable solution to increase literacy among the poorest of the poor. Hope you think so too. Thank you, Debbie. Sustainable and scalable, it sounds like us. Okay, so I think we have time for uh, one, maybe two questions. Does somebody have a question? And you're free to, to direct it at a specific panelist or the panel in general. What are you thinking about? All right, Tony, or somebody in the panel. Part of the problem with um, innovations and trying to do research, really quality research on innovations, is that by the time the research comes out, there's a new innovation that has made the research sort of irrelevant. Um, so how do you keep pace with changing um, technologies and changing ideas and changing environments and keep a good solid evidence base going along? Can I hand the microphone down? 
I think you need to talk to Best Buy. They have a buyback program. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, the important part of this is that research is ongoing, and when the old research is obsolete, it's still it's not obsolete because you know it doesn't work anymore. I think this is an important issue. We always talk about best practice. We don't talk about worst practice, uh, failed projects. Those are very important projects because it doesn't work, and we don't want to go there again. So the research that you think is gone and a new innovation came back, still you need those research from previous times because some of them would still be uh, uh, needed when you program the new program. The other issue is that some, we, whether we like it or not, many of the developing countries still uh, are in a stage where some of the research that has not worked here, but it still works there because they have not came to a sphere where they can use the new innovation yet. So they have to cross the path uh, through that uh, research process. And you know, just because technology changed from black and white TV to uh, Android doesn't mean everything becomes obsolete. You know, thank you. Jane and then Tony? Yeah. Um, another thing about it, using technology in the context of libraries is that it's important, and this is something librarians struggle with everywhere in the world. I mean, information technology by its nature is not sustainable. And so how can a library have continuity? And it's very important to develop products that, can, that are not bound to a particular technology. So for example, I mean, we've been using the One Laptop for Child laptops in our libraries for the last few years. We are pretty certain that they, and they are excellent, they're, they work perfectly for, for our needs right now, but I don't know what the future of those are. So everything that we're developing, and, and we develop these literacy lessons using eToys, an OLPC application, but they can run on any platform. So, if, for example, I, when I presented it at the eLearning Africa conference in Dar es Salaam last, uh, in May, uh, we talked to people who were developing cell phone applications in Finland, and these, these eToys games can work on cell phones, they can work on anything. So, so it's important to think of the, the innovation itself sort of separate from the hardware development. Yeah, and just quickly, I'd say the same thing. Don't chase the technology. What happens a lot of ministries of education and donors are chasing the glimmer of the eye of what they saw on the metro as they were coming in. And I think what we need to do is appropriate sustainable technology and apply it to the intractable development problems we have. So work with the reading specialists to identify the opportunities for the appropriate use. On the other hand, take advantage of technology. Desktop virtualization uses the power of a single computer to be able to power a number of other desktops or another, a number of other monitors. That's a way that you can make technology work for you. E-Granary is a project out of the University of Iowa. They're downloading millions of websites, putting it on hard drives, and disseminating it to communities that don't have connectivity. So what are the opportunities for us to take advantage of the power of technology to make it appropriate and accessible for the communities we serve? The last is, of course, mobile phones. Other sectors we had heard earlier, such as health and agriculture, are using mobile phones uh, in terms of helping their development hypothesis. Um, how might we use that infrastructure, if not exclusively the mobile phone, the infrastructure uh, for uh, data and assessment gathering? Absolutely. Debbie? Uh, well, I also wanted to speak to the power of open source um, software so that any user with a little bit of experience can actually tailor something with, like the talking book, that it has a USB connection built in, a mini USB, so it can, if there is a single cell phone, upload and download content from the internet and also hook up to computers and so on. And further, um, the statistics, the user statistics are stored inside. So when it does hook up to a computer um, or another talking book, people themselves in the field can track what's most effective. So we're trying to um, you know, get the innovation to be accessible to the poorest of the poor. Thank you, Corey. Just to go back to Shaquille's recommendation that we think inside the box as well as outside the box, it is to plea that there's still a lot of basic research that is absolutely imperative that we conduct to people to understand how children learn, how they um, acquire literacy skills, and even if there is research that has been conducted 
in the United States or other developing countries with complex language structures. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done that um, Ruth Reed and other organizations are doing to really understand um, how children learn in, um, in countries that where this research hasn't been conducted in the languages that are more regular uh, than some of the languages that we uh, tend to work in. Well said. And with that, I think we are out of time. What I want to wrap up is don't get too attached to the technologies. Focus on the basic research, the best practices, the best interactions between people, and get the innovators and the inventors and the entrepreneurs to, to look at that before they come up with their next great idea. So thank you very much to a great panel.